Thank you. Could I please ask those who have, uh, are in the gallery, our visitors today, if they could please leave the chamber quickly and quietly as we are about to go back into our session. Thank you very much for your cooperation. The next item of business is a Members' Business Debate on Motion 14683 in the name of Paul O'Kane on Challenge Poverty Week 2024. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Paul O'Kane to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to bring this debate to mark Challenge Poverty Week 2024. And I want to begin by thanking members uh, of all parties who signed the motion to allow this debate to take place. And I think it's important, uh, an important symbol of the cross-party consensus that really ought to uh, govern how we debate these issues in Parliament in terms of tackling poverty in all of its forms. Because whilst we will have disagreements uh, on policy, I think it is important that Parliament is united uh, in debating these issues. Because we know that poverty in Scotland remains unacceptably high, and this year's report from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation highlights that very deep poverty in Scotland is up to 40 per cent, having surged since the mid-1990s, and 240,000 children still languish in poverty as rates of child poverty remain static, uh, as so much research, I think, has now demonstrated. So there is much work to be done, I think, across all spheres of government, in this Parliament, of course, and for the Scottish Government. But I, of course, recognise UK Government and local government role in this work also. And I said in a previous debate this week that I think it was very important that both the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice launched the Joseph Rowntree report together on Monday and responded together, thinking about how they can embark on a new area of partnership in terms of how we tackle poverty. And I don't want to relitigate too heavily the politics uh, of this issue and some of the politics we've had this week, but I do hope that this debate ends up being the discussion that we should have perhaps had earlier in the week in government time, that the government chose not to have, because I think it's important that in Challenge Poverty Week we show our respect to the third sector organisations and the anti-poverty campaigners who put so much into this week and all year round to ensure that these issues are at the forefront of our agenda here in Parliament. This week does provide, I think, a vital point in the year where civil society is able to come together and showcase what is happening out there and the best practice that is going on uh, across Scotland. So in particular, I think it's important that I give mention to the work of the Poverty Alliance, who have coordinated Challenge to Poverty Week each year since 2013. Bringing together all groups and projects is no small task, especially on top of all of the other work that they do year round. And I'm pleased that we are joined in the gallery today by representatives of Poverty Alliance. And I'm sure we're all very grateful for the work and the briefing that they've provided uh, to all of us members here in Parliament. So there is, there is much work to do and many areas where we do need different interventions. And as I've said, all spheres of government must take tailored approaches in different ways um, to ensure um, that we reach everyone, uh, no matter what their background is. And I think that's very evident from the themes that have been highlighted uh, in each week, uh, in each day, sorry, of this important week. Uh, we could look at an issue like housing. We have many debates in this chamber about housing, and we have recently. The effects of ina inadequate and unaffordable housing on poverty rates are significant. And we need to understand how the housing emergency affects different groups, and that's why I welcome Shelter and Engender's research published this week, showing the disproportionate effects felt by women in particular and the need for a gendered response to the housing emergency. On transport, we need to support people to access their places of work, to access business and services, and to access their support network. So it is concerning to see um, the end of off-peak rail uh, fares pilot, increasing costs to working people, uh, commuting to work, the distance covered by local bus services having fallen by 15 per cent since 2011-12, and the number of passenger journeys falling by 52 per cent in two since 2007-2008. So there is much more we need to do in this place and across our local authorities by supporting and empowering them uh, on public transport. And I'll give way to Paul Sweeney. <laughs> I thank my friend for giving way. He's making a very powerful speech highlighting that poor mental health on World Mental Health Day as it is today is a critical factor and is driven by the symptoms of poverty. Uh, and particularly when we look at, for example, people seeking asylum in Scotland, they were denied free 
bus travel, that has had a huge effect on their mental health and it's particularly egregious. Does he agree that if we're to deal with poor mental health in this country, we need to solve the scourge of poverty in every possible way? I thank my uh, friend for his intervention and he makes a very important point as we discuss these thematic issues. It's clear to me that um, poor health and in particular poor mental health is um, both um, a result of poverty but also I think when we look at social determinants of health is actually something that we need to deal with in a very, very serious way and I think it's important that we put that on the record today to think about what our interventions can be in that space and I thank him for the work that he does in that regard and of course um, the work he's done in terms of uh, free travel for asylum seekers, some of the poorest uh, individuals in our society, which, which he raises today. Uh, we know that adequate income is an important theme of this week as well, and work poverty is at record levels, and we need to look at the level of income that people receive to make sure that it meets the needs of working people. And I'd point here to the work of Close the Gap, who I met uh, alongside other members of the End Child Poverty Coalition and my Scottish Labour colleagues yesterday, who have highlighted that inadequate income for women and the gender pay gap is directly tied to child poverty. It is, of course, why I welcome uh, the work today by the UK Government to introduce that new deal for working people, which I think will begin to tackle the insecurity, instability and low pay in work that adds to poverty. Um, I'll take an intervention. Play hobby. Thank you very much. And, and, uh, you know, I'm listening very carefully to what Paul O'Kane is saying here. And, he, and when he mentions child poverty, he knows where I'm going to go on this, about the two-child benefit cap. And would he join me in calling on the Chancellor to review that in the upcoming budget? Paul O'Kane. I thank Ms Hockey for her intervention and she and I have debated these issues uh, many times and she knows that uh, I am committed to a review of universal credit that includes the two child limit. That is the work that has been set in the context of the Child Poverty Task Force, which the UK Government is taking forward. The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions began that work along with Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson, because it is important, and I have said many times in this chamber, universal credit does not work. It needs to be reviewed in all of its parts, and we need to see um, a considered piece of work done to uh, review all of those issues in terms of child poverty and how we reduce that. Um, I, I want to briefly just touch, if I can, um, Presiding Officer, because I'm, I'm aware of time, of the work that's been done in food insecurity across this week and by organisations. We all know that it is a travesty that food banks are necessary in modern-day Scotland. We, of course, all want to, I think, work for a society where nobody needs to rely on them. But they do, of course, um, demonstrate the best people in our communities who want to throw their arms around the people who are most in need. And I'll take this opportunity, if I can, to highlight the many community groups in my own region who are running um, um, food, food banks and indeed food pantries and, and food security uh, projects and, and the work that they do is uh, very admirable because not only is it about the provision of food but also trying to take a holistic view of getting support to people who most need it and very often that can also, uh, referring back to my colleague's point about mental health, support people with their mental health and, and with what is going on in their life. So I would point to the work of uh, Morton in the community, the charitable arm of Greenock Morton FC, um, who hosts collections for Inverclyde Food Bank and offer a range of services at the club to support people. So uh, I'm very conscious uh, of time, uh, presiding officer. I, I will finish by just highlighting one further thing that I think has been highlighted in this week, if I may, which is sustainable funding for the third sector. All of these projects are vitally important, but they cannot continue to do their work without sustainable and fair funding. And that is something that I know the minister and the government have heard me speak about. And it is very important that we reflect on that today. So I do hope the, the minister might be able to cover it in summing up. I am very grateful um, for this debate. I hope it is constructive. Uh, and I'm very grateful to you, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kane. I, I would advise members that actually because we have a two o'clock start, uh, we really must stick to time because otherwise it is not fair to the parliamentary staff who are required to clear the chamber before we start uh, resume our afternoon's business. So I will ask members now to stick to their allotted time, which is up to four minutes. And with that, I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I'm grateful to Paula Kane for securing today's debate. And I want to acknowledge the Poverty Alliance and the wider third sector for their efforts, not just in coordinating Challenge Poverty Week, but to challenge poverty day in and day out. I will focus most of my remarks on areas of consensus across the Chamber based on the Challenge Poverty Week themes. And we are all agreed that there are challenges with housing supply. And this Parliament has declared a housing emergency across Scotland, and my own local council has declared one in South Lanarkshire. <clears throat> Equally, there is a housing emergency in England and Wales. 
I therefore welcome the First Minister's announcement of nearly £600 million for social and affordable housing this year, something which will build on the SNP Government's delivery of nearly 135,000 such homes, including around 5,400 in South Lanarkshire. So, in the spirit of consensus, I encourage Labour colleagues to ensure the Chancellor's first budget tackles the housing emergency. Rachel Reeves must reverse the £1.3 billion cut to Scotland's capital budget to unlock money for house building and uprate local housing allowance to help low-income households struggling with rent. On transport, with the Scottish Government's expansion of concessionary bus travel to under-22s, over 2 million people in Scotland, including older and disabled people, can travel for free by bus. And I think there is actually agreement across the Chamber about improving our bus system. And the recent Transport Act gives local authorities the power to run local bus services fit for local needs. I welcome the Scottish Government's work around in integrating different transport methods as well. So in East School Bride, parts of the town, including Stuart Field and the village, don't have adequate bus services, and many people need to drive or take a bus to use the train. Going forward, an integrated ticket and improved bus service would help people leave the car at home and, importantly, tackle the effects of poverty. In terms of adequate incomes, the Scottish Government established an expert group, including representatives from all five parties, to consider a minimum income guarantee. And I look forward to reading the final report when it is published soon. So, With the limited powers of devolution, the SNP Government has built a new social security system in Scotland based on the principles of fairness, dignity and respect, which is delivering 15 benefits, seven of which are unique to Scotland. So from the game-changing Scottish child payment to adult disability payment, we are supporting around 1.2 million people in tackling poverty. The carer support payment is financially supporting unpaid carers, and the Carers Allowance Supplement tops up their incomes beyond the UK system. There is much more I would like to say, President Officer, but I need to conclude. Since it was reconve reconvened 25 years ago, this Parliament has made great strides in challenging and tackling poverty. With policies like free personal care for everyone who needs it, concessionary bus travel, for people young and old, and the Scottish Child Payment, which is estimated the member is about to conclude. Hopefully, thank you. Which is estimated to be keeping 60,000 kids out of poverty this year. This Parliament is delivering measures which benefit all our citizens and tackle inequality. So, as we reflect this Challenge Poverty Week. I hope we can build on these steps Ms. Stevenson, could and you work please together bring your to please. eradicate the scourge of poverty on our society. Thank you very much. I now call uh, Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Pam Duncan Clancy. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I want to begin by thanking my friend Paul Kane for securing this member's debate. It is encouraging to have a parliament engage in not one but two debates regarding Challenge Poverty Week this year. It's important that we as MSPs always remember that we are here to serve the whole of Scotland, with special regard for the most vulnerable among our citizens. Whatever decisions are made in this building, we must always be thinking first and foremost of how will it affect them. In that spirit, Deputy President Officer, I don't think it will surprise anyone to hear but I want to spend my time today highlighting the continued difficulties of disabled people in Scotland. Some may say that this debate is not a disability issue and we should focus solely on the core issue of poverty. But to those people I say that you cannot truly challenge poverty without confronting the frankly disturbing figures that describe the dire straits that disabled people in Scotland find themselves today. Only around 
of registered working age disabled people are in employment compared to over 80% of their non disabled counterparts. 25% of individuals in families with at least one disabled member live in income poverty compared to 16% of individuals in households with no disabled member. According to the Georgia Voluntary Foundation 2023 data, 23% of families with a disabled member are behind on at least one bill and 30% have no savings to fall back on. President Officer, there can be no argument that disabled people in Scotland are being left behind. That's not a political point. It is a recognition of the reality we find ourselves today. Scotland in the 21st century is not a place that allows all disabled people to thrive. So what are we going to do about it? This is Challenge Poverty Week after all. How are we going to challenge disabled poverty? Well, the simplest way is to begin to address the source, is to listen to disabled people. We must give them a strong voice. I'd be willing to bet that many people across this chamber and across all levels of government were not aware of some of the staggering figures that I read out just a moment ago. And that's not because we don't care, it's because disabled people do not have the time, energy or resources to make their voices heard. Before the end of this year, the Scottish Parliament will probably be asked to vote on a proposal to give disabled people a champion who can speak on their behalf. A lot of noise has been made about the crowded landscapes and the fact there are already organisations that should be providing that voice. But the reality is that they aren't. The Human Rights Commission, the Children's Commission, all of them are clearly not picking up the slack that is there. If the Parliament does not support the proposal, then you are asking disabled people to trust the institutions that have let them down time and time again, and for them to suddenly to change. If we haven't done it before, why should we believe that we would do it in the future? To close, Deputy President Officer, if we really want to challenge poverty, if we really want to challenge disabled poverty, we will vote to give them that voice. We would vote for a disability commissioner. Forget the politics, let's do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to speak today in this debate and thank Paul Keynes for bringing it forward in such a significant and important week. And that's why I'd like to start by thanking the many organisations across Scotland, especially the Poverty Alliance, who we've heard are here today, for such a successful, challenging Poverty Week 2024, for bringing organisations across Scotland to focus efforts and increase public support for tackling poverty and for highlighting the realities of and solutions to it. People have come together in communities, organisations, schools and even in this parliament to rise against poverty and, and discuss the solutions to it and support people living with it. Because right now in Scotland, one in, over one million people live in poverty. One in four are children and in some areas of Glasgow, the region I represent, over half of children are living in poverty. And we know as well that poverty disproportionately impacts certain groups the hardest. And I'd echo much of what my colleague Jeremy Balfour and Paul O'Kane have said on that matter. The GRF's report found that ch children in working age adults in a family where someone is disabled were three times as likely to experience low income. EIS's recent report, Standing Up to Poverty, shows that children living alongside three or more other children in the household those with a disabled household member, minority ethnic households and single parent households are all at greater risk. And as Close the Gap reminded us ahead of today, women are more likely to be in poverty than men, more likely to experience in-work poverty than men, and are more likely to experience persistent poverty than men. Presiding officer, poverty is a scandal. It widens inequality and it holds people back. We cannot and must not tolerate that because there really should be no class, glass or step ceiling in the way of opportunity. And the problems that, put, that are put in its way are great. The scale of the challenge is extreme and the scale of action therefore required must match it. 
We need action in housing, including in the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, to ensure people, including children, live in safe, secure and permanent homes, which is why many organisations are disappointed that that budget was cut and have urged the government to respond to the housing emergency swiftly and with a resourced plan. Action to support families who need it the most by meeting the costs they face, including fuel and travel. And on travel costs, um, I'd like to echo my colleagues Paul O'Kane and Paul Sweeney's call for the government on peak fares and travel for asylum seekers. So too is the need to reduce costs by disabled people, including ending care charges, which I'm disappointed to say still exist, despite the government saying they would scrap them. And access to food is also crucial. So free school meals for all pupils is key. I hope that on this the government will listen to other, uh, Parliament and others and consider fulfilling the promise it made in that regard, because CPAC has found that 20 per cent of children in poverty in Scotland are missing out on free school meals. But, presiding officer, where actions in these areas fall short, third sectors step in. Third sector organisations step in. That is why another key issue, of course, highlighted this week is the need for fair funding for the third sector. Funding for the third sector is, not, is, just, is about overall resource, yes, but it is also about the way that government offers and handles that funding. In particular, late decisions in your movements are all unsettling and in many insecure roles that affects morale, retention and delivery of critical frontline services. But despite this, people who work in the third sector work tirelessly and passionately to improve lives every day. Sign officer, ahead of today and this week, organisations have set out what they want their policymakers to do, or at least consider. The range of asks includes a wide spectrum um, covering housing, transport, adequate incomes, food costs of the school day and even the unequal distribution of pay and work, as I have spoken about, to help unlock people from the grip of poverty. We on these benches know there is no silver bullet, but the doing nothing cannot be an option. That is why my party is working in government to take action to tackle poverty at its roots with the New Deal for Working People, GB Energy bringing well-paid jobs to Scotland and bringing down bills, and ending tax breaks for private schools. So that we have Ms. Duncan Clancy, you will need to conclude, schools. please. Presiding officer, that's just some examples of what we can do to end poverty in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan Clancy. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Megan Gallagher. Ms. Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. I thank Paul O'Kane for his motion and for securing this important debate during Challenge Poverty Week. I'm grateful too for briefings from third sector organisations for this and the Scottish Government debate on Tuesday. And of course, for all the work of the Poverty Alliance and its members in organising this annual series of events and projects and in advocating for urgent and vital policies to address both the causes and the symptoms of poverty. The North East region, which I represent, spans a wide spectrum in terms of poverty statistics. Of all Scottish local authorities, Dundee City has the fifth highest percentage of data zones that are in the 20% most deprived in Scotland while Aberdeenshire is towards the other end of the scale. Over 28% of children in Dundee live in poverty, nearly 25% in Angus, approaching 22% in Aberdeen City, and fewer than 17% in Aberdeenshire. But all of these figures are too high. Because people experience poverty in all of these areas in different ways, and being poor in a rural, relatively prosperous area can be more difficult in many ways, more isolating than sharing common experiences with a greater number of neighbours. The Poverty Alliance Network includes organisations which support and represent people in poverty across Scotland in cities, towns and rural actions in rural areas, and their actions and work is truly valued. Just as poverty takes different forms in different places, so people with particular characteristics or identities may be, through structural oppression and prejudice, made more likely to experience poverty. Some of the most acute forms of poverty and destitution are imposed upon migrants, including those seeking asylum, who are neither permitted to work freely nor entitled to receive social security payments. The Grampian Regional Equality Council, based in Aberdeen, has carried out a successful No Recourse to Public Funds project to raise awareness of this situation, to share experiences and work with others in the No Recourse North East Partnership to mitigate its worst impacts. In Dundee, meanwhile, many community organisations are working to help local people and families to cope with the effects of food and energy inflation. One such is the Hilltown community Larder, which, for a small payment, provides a range of groceries to members, as well as offering signposting to other support services. 
In Dundee yesterday, as part of Challenge Poverty Week, S Circle Mobility, Dundee Cab, Hillcrest Homes, Dundee International Women's Centre, Stobswell Forum and Dundee Carer Centre all came together at the Boomerang Community Centre. Together with council staff, they spoke about the impacts of fuel poverty and other forms of ongoing poverty in the city, both providing advice to those affected and raising wider awareness of the gravity of these issues. And in Angus, Home Energy Scotland is offering free advice on energy saving and its, in its Get Ready for Winter events, yesterday in Arbroath and tomorrow in Forfa. All of these groups, all of these people, all of these communities coming together, helping each other. Scotland is so rich in community and third sector organisations, large and small, depending largely upon volunteers who give their time and energies with care, compassion and a deep-seated sense of justice and solidarity. But they also share common concerns and anxieties about the financial sustainability of their work. Without secure, multi-year funding, essential services are thrown into turmoil, with organisations unable to make decisions about staffing, premises and the projects upon which vulnerable people rely. As I said in my speech on Tuesday, challenging poverty means recognising its realities, mitigating its effects and making structural changes to transform the way our society works. All of these tasks involve the dedicated work of third sector organisations, and none would be possible without them. They deserve not only our thanks and commendation, but financial certainty, certainty security and respect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. <clears throat> I now call Megan Gallagher to be followed by Marie McNair. Ms Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am pleased to be able to contribute to Paula Kane's members debate to highlight the importance of Challenge Poverty Week 2024. I'm going to use my time today to raise an important issue that I've been looking into for quite some time, and it relates to Paula Kane's opening contribution when he mentioned the importance of provision of food. When I was the spokesperson for children and young people, I visited Stirling Food Bank after I was contacted by an individual who wanted to help families with babies but had managed to come across a huge barrier. That barrier was supplying baby milk to families in need. Milk, of course, is essential for the first stages of an infant's life, and if the mother is unable to breastfeed, they rely solely on baby milk and formula. The nutrients contained within the milk is vital for a baby's healthy growth and development. But for those who are struggling financially, trying to keep up with the cost of bottles and tins can leave many in a worrying situation. And to put this into context, it can cost up to £18 for baby formula powder per 800 grams. And if you had a, a baby like mine when uh, Charlotte was growing up, that can be a lot of tins over a very short period of time. At present, food banks are not permitted to accept or distribute infant formula donations. And although I do fully accept that this guidance comes from UNICEF rather than Scottish or UK governments, to me, it makes no sense whatsoever of denying a family of this this vital product which they may need to help provide for their own child. Local authorities, health boards, public health teams play an important role in identifying families with meeting the needs of infant formula through wraparound care. However, my concern, and my concern has been for quite some time, that families fall through the gaps in the system. And some, of course, will go to a food bank when it hits crisis point instead of following the route through direct services, which I mentioned just there. UNICEF suggests that food banks cont uh, contact health visiting services, public health teams, local authorities or health boards to agree on a referral strategy regarding families in crisis and needing support. But this can be a very long process that is met with layers of bureaucracy. Families who need to feed their babies need that help directly. They simply cannot wait to go through the various, uh, the various uh, layers of this system. The Healthy Start scheme, of course, is another route, but it's not immediate. And of course, it's not, el it's not the case that all families are eligible to use this. I understand the risks of food banks handing out baby milk, but I also understand the risks of buying baby milk from a supermarket. To me, it's exactly the same thing. And there must be a way around it, because a supermarket in Buxton was able to support local uh, a local paper campaign to support the High Peak Baby Bank. 
They were able to donate items from supermarkets, including formula, wipes and food. But the guidance has got to be clearer. Uh, it is simply common sense, in my view, to ensure that families are able to access baby milk and formula if needed. And I would welcome the opportunity to speak with the Minister at a future point to talk about how we can maybe engage with UNICEF directly to see if there is any way that we can get through these barriers in order for charities and organisations who are doing a wonderful job to be able to help families in need. Presiding officer, this of course is Challenge Poverty Week and I hope there is a day where families do not need to rely on food banks. But until we tackle the root causes of poverty, we need to make sure that those vital items are available to support families with babies. I fully believe that every child deserves the best possible start in life. And one way that we can improve the health and well-being of babies in Scotland is to look at how we supply baby milk through food banks. So I would urge the Scottish Government to look into this matter with me. I am more than happy to work with them on this matter to, and to adopt that common sense approach to tackling poverty here in Scotland. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. And I now call Marie McNair. Ms McNair. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome Paul O'Kane's members' debate on Challenge Poverty Week. It follows on to a significant Scottish Government debate on Tuesday, and I thank uh, all anti-poverty organisations for the briefings they have provided. Poverty can often be hidden behind closed doors or masked by pride, but it is a persistent and systematic issue. Somatic issue, sorry. Uh, unfortunately, it can be about parents and elderly people uh, choosing between heating and eating, and it's not something any of us in this chamber will be facing. So it's up to us to push for the change we need to see. Tackling child poverty is one of the biggest priorities of the SNP government, and something we remain firmly focused on. We will prioritise those most in need with a range of policies, including the Scottish Child Payment, noted by the Poverty and Inequality Commission as a game changer and one of the main contributors to progress in reducing child poverty at national level. When I spoke in this debate last year, President Officer, I listed the many organisations in my community who challenged poverty, not just for one week, but 365 days of the year. And this remains true today. There are simply so many, so I cannot name them all, but again, it is important to me to put on record my thanks to Golden Friendships, Oakle Patrick Food Parcels, Faithfully Food Share, Eastern Bartonshire Food Bank, Damier Barclay Church Community Pantry, Western Bartonshire Community Food Share, The Recycle Room, Eastern Bartonshire Citizen Advice Bureau, Improving Lives, Western Bartonshire Citizen Advice Bureau, Claybank Group Holidays, Advice Staff in East and Western Bartonshire Council, the Claybank Asbestos Group, and so, so many more. Every day these organisations are saving lives, every day these organisations show kindness, warmth and dedication to serving those most in need and in turn make our communities a better place. And I look forward to seeing all of these wonderful organisations at my cost of living event next month, an event which they all come to ready to help our communities. The fact that these groups must exist in this day and age is appalling. And the UK welfare regime that fuels their existence needs a radical overhaul to make it fit for purpose. Unfortunately, so far, it is more of the same. And now, for many pensioners, things have even got worse. And no movement on child poverty either. Despite good efforts by the last Labour government, Labour has become now the party of child poverty. The two-child policy and its abhorrent rape clause, the the fact that Labour have just kept children in poverty and they have actually dragged them into it. And a new report by CPAG has stated that every day the two-child policy remains in place, 109 children are being pulled into poverty. And CPAG are clear, and I quote, scrapping the two-child limit is the most cost-effective way to stop more kids being pulled into poverty on the UK's government's watch. Labour MSPs should demand it scrapped in the budget, and I hope they do. Um, but this week, they so far failed to do so. Um, but credit where credit is due, it was good to see, and I commend Richard Leonard and Alex Rowley for um, doing so. It is very telling um, that the SNP have done more than uh, today's new Labour Party to keep in place a Gordon Brown policy to keep pensioners keeping warm this winter. So, unfortunately, real change is not coming. And it looks Marie McNair will be yeah. concluding quite soon. I generally would take an intervention. I would really like to hear what you have got to say, but um, I need to keep going. So, um, so unfortunately, real change is not coming, as I have said. It looks like, to adapt a previous slogan from New Labour, things can only get worse. 
The powers of independence will let us leave the tragedy behind, and with the powers of independence we can truly challenge poverty, and only with control over our own affairs we will see that and truly achieve a more equal and poverty-free Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNair. And I now call on Minister Kokab Stewart to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Paul O'Kane uh, for bringing forward this important debate and thank members for their contributions, and I will try to respond to as many as possible. Listening today and reflecting on the many activities happening this week reinforces that tackling poverty is a collective effort and a national mission, as was mentioned by Paul O'Kane. I am also grateful to the hundreds of third sector organisations who are working tirelessly to support and advocate for those in poverty, often providing lifeline support for those who need it the most. Ending child poverty is the foremost priority of this government, but we can only achieve this by ensuring that we are tackling the deep-rooted causes uh, of inequalities in our society and ensuring that every community can thrive. Despite an incredibly challenging fiscal, uh, fiscal context, we have continued to invest around £3 billion each year since 2022-23 on policies that tackle child poverty and protect people from the effects of the cost of living. And this, of course, includes the Scottish Child Payment, which is providing absolute essential support to that, as Ruth Boyle of Poverty Alliance, who I know are here, uh, today in the chamber told the social justice uh, the social justice and social security committee is having a clear impact on parents ability to provide the essentials that their children require um, and I refer to Megan Gallagher's uh, comments that she raised uh, very legitimately about food insecurities um, and I will consider her proposals it further includes free bus travel for over 2 million people, supporting young and old people with uh, disabilities to access essential services and live fuller lives, and help to keep warm in winter, with guaranteed support for our winter heating payment for people on low incomes, including those on pension credit and other relevant benefits. We are delivering support to those who need it most, with Scottish Government modelling published in February estimating that this Government's policies will keep 100,000 children out of relative poverty in 2024-25. I will now take some time to uh, refer to members' uh, um, uh, speeches that they made, and I heard several calls for fairer funding for the third sector. And we are committed to developing this approach. It provides clarity, stability to secure the sector's resilience and grow its capacity. However, it is important to recognise that multi-year funding is very challenging to deliver in the current context, as any commitments will inevitably reduce flexibility in future years. We are, though, uh, where possible, aim to increase the number of multi-year grant offers to third sector organisations. Housing was also mentioned by Paul O'Kane, Colette Stevenson and Pam Duncan Glancy. And it is critical to tackling poverty, and that's why we declared a housing emergency in May and have been working at pace since then to take urgent action. We have committed £100 million to grow investment and support the construction of around 2,800 mid-market rent homes, and we have made £22 million of investment to the charitable bond programme to support more than 150 new affordable affordable homes. Ethnic minorities uh, was mentioned in Paul O'Kane's uh, motion, and we acknowledge that too many people from ethnic minority backgrounds are living in poverty. And we are taking uh, wide-ranging action to tackle the deep-rooted inequalities there. And that includes investing £6.3 uh, through our Equality and Human Rights Fund across 2021-25 to support race equality and anti-racism organisations 
organisations such as Beamus Scotland, MECOP, Amina, the Muslim Women's Resource Centre, for example, to provide targeted support for ethnic minority communities, including advice, advocacy and training. The Scottish Government also recognises the lived experience and reality and the multiple barriers that disabled people face and that real change is needed. And I thank once again Jeremy Palfer for his very articulate and very impassioned uh, work on this, uh, raising it continually as he should. We continue to work very closely with uh, disabled people's organisations to develop and implement a plan that is informed by the lived experience of disabled people and I was um, I have been attending meetings uh, very recently. I share, the government shares Jeremy Balfour's commitment towards improving outcomes and we will consider very carefully the detail of the bill that he referred to. Um, I don't have the time, unfortunately, Pam Duncan Glancy on that. Um, presiding officer, being mindful of time, um, I would like to mention that the UK government does have a role to play in this. And there is clear evidence that the policies of the previous UK government, such as the two child cap uh, limit, um, as was mentioned by Marie McNair, um, are actively pushing vulnerable families into deepening poverty and that more and more households are affected by the this. Uh, I note uh, other members have mentioned the work of the jo Joseph Ranstree Foundation, so um, I know that uh, time is coming to an end. So, presiding officer, I am proud of the action that we have taken. Challenge Poverty Week is a powerful reminder uh, of both the reality of poverty and that it is not inevitable. By working together across all governments, all sectors, and with people with lived experience, we can bring about lasting change. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2pm. Thank you.